world, I'm Laura Haywood, and today I'm joined by one of Broadway's most enduring powerhouses. Christine Andreas is known for her Tony-nominated turns in Oklahoma and On Your Toes, as well as most recently playing the scene-stealing Jacqueline in the Tony Award-winning 2011 revival of La Cage aux Folles. What's she been doing since then? Well, she's been touring with a live cabaret show called Piaf, No Regrets, a love letter to Edith Piaf featuring a wealth of the French chanteuse's most beautiful songs, which is now an album available everywhere, and the tour will continue. To discuss the album and that course, Responding to her, let's welcome Christine Andreas. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thanks. I have not turned this album off since I got it in my hot little hands. Good news. It is really fantastic. Um, a lot of it's in French, but not all of it. I was no. actually surprised to hear some English words on there. Can you talk about the decision to make it a bilingual album and the translations? Well, I just thought it was important because you know, if it's one thing to be live and singing it, and maybe there's a little more in my show when I'm doing the show, mm -hmm. uh, a little more history of her, but when you're just listening to a CD or a, you know, a download, I want her world to be put before you because I think her world was very important. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I mean, if you're sitting there always trying to figure out what I'm saying, you know, if you have an idea of what the song is, I don't speak French. Which shocked me when I learned that. It's such a big reveal. I know, but... So even from that perspective, not speaking it, I wanted, and I, and I did some of those little translations myself. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because I, I wanted to put the story in front of you. She did story songs, mm -hmm. and the words were carefully chosen, what she wanted to sing about. She's always sang from her life. You know, she had songs written about her life in every phase. So if you want to know her, you got to kind of know what is being sung. Wait, how did you do the translations yourself if you don't speak French? Very carefully. <laughs> With a dictionary? <laughs> no, which, I mean, I know what I'm singing about. Oh, got it. And so then you sort of just try to make it a little more poetic mm -hmm. here and there. <laughs> so if, if a French person ever tries to have a conversation with you, as long as they use the lyrics of Piaf songs, you I'll can understand fine. them. Yeah. That's amazing. Mais oui. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning. Why Edith Piaf? It's a very large question, and I didn't know for the longest time why. And... After listening to you speak, I did a little homework today myself and to see where <laughs> you were from. I think we're both like intuitive about what we do, why we do. We just it just makes us feel good, so we do it. So French has haunted me for a long time. And I always was very happy singing in the language. I hear the music in the language. So that piece didn't totally wasn't totally daunting. But Piaf and a whole show on a on a real person was a little daunting. So I needed to be pushed and provoked a bit about it even though it had occurred to me in the past. And so two very different artists really provoked me. And one was a band leader on a gorgeous ship named Raphael Dirksen, and he mm -hmm. is French-Canadian. I kept saying, and I do, my husband and I travel the world two or three or four times a year. We should mention he did all the arrangements yes, on this Martin album Silvestri. and also has some vocals. Yeah. Yes, um, it's his so debut. Yeah, well, he sounds <laughs> fantastic in, he cute? in all the ways. I yeah. know. No, he's a showman. He's really good. Marty's a consummate showman. Anyway, so Rafi approached me and he said, I really want you to do a show in PF. I want to I help you put it together. And I went, no, because I knew it would be a lot of work. I'm not a stranger to work, but I just didn't think that's where I wanted my energy to go. He persisted and persisted, and finally I said, okay, fine. Send me arc something. Send me a treatment. Send me something. And he sent me this fabulous... I could see it, feel it, touch it, taste it, and I had to do it. So we did it. And How it, long ago was that? This was maybe three years ago. Okay. Maybe, f yeah, three, I think, maybe three. So after three Lacage. Oh, yeah, definitely. And after you were Lacage. definitely living the French. I have been living French there, on and off yeah. forever, you know? So, you know, nee, 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 nee. there's <laughs> something in that, you know? My life has always seemed to go that way. Yeah. You when know, you look at something. it now, it seems inevitable. In a way, yeah. 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 And, then a, and then a great who's become a great friend, Pascal Rieu, of Rieu Dance New York. He's Parisian French. And I didn't know him. He called me. He had a whole different take of a whole different show called Street Singer, which I still actively perform. I just did it about a month ago in Bethlehem. And Rieu Dance is currently, I think, performing right now in New York. They're Martha Graham based. He was a Martha Graham soloist. He approached me about his show, which was singing Piaf to these beautiful dancers. And I said, because I'm very honest. I said, Pascal, you, you have to understand, though, I, I don't speak French. Mm -hmm. And there was this long pause. And then this voice with a smile says, I know. 
I saw you on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he still wanted to work with me. And then, of course, I coached a little more because there's such intricacies in the language. It's so beautiful. So I did that show. And then finally, I took the elements of both because then by then, she's haunting me herself. Mm -hmm. Herself. What it's does that haunting. mean? I don't exactly. What does it look like? That she's haunting me. It looks yeah, like. like, like <laughs> it's not a look, it's a sound. Uh -huh. There's, I, I'm so. I just. I just feel provoked. It's not, it's not even like words. It's just a constant, like, it just comes across my sphere, mm -hmm. her energy. And I go, what's that? And that's not, I'm a little out there like that. So that's not unusual for me. You know, as an artist, you're always out there looking for the next channel for your expression, you know? And you don't always know where it's going to come from. So when something keeps pushing itself in front of me, she was just pushing, she's a pushy broad she kept <laughs> pushing herself in front of me so I went okay okay fine mm -hmm. and I just relaxed with it and suddenly it just started flowing and I I read this lovely book yeah by Carolyn Burke called Piaf No Regrets and I learned that Piaf herself had it was first it's just a fascinating story and she pumped up the truth a lot she'd embellished the truth a lot yeah she was like and an instagram star before there was instagram she was amazing she did all of her own pr and she was a very modern woman but as if her life wasn't fascinating enough she was always embellishing it so i kind of felt she was saying to me it's time to just set the truth out there mm -hmm. so that there's a beautiful quote in here, which I won't do right, that Carolyn Burke, the uh, author, actually says that when you lean on the tragic myth, you do a disservice to the life of the artist, to their artistry. Because, you know, if you think of Garland, you just keep thinking, oh, it's so sad, it's so sad, all the pills. And there's just some phenomenal artists there, too. But sometimes the tragedy just usurps the actual artist. So I think Edith was saying, put who I am out there, who I really am, mm -hmm. for a generation that most likely doesn't know me in this country anyway, maybe in Europe but not here, and also where you can have instant celebrity. I mean, you tell me from where you sit, you know, you must see a number of people who may be really wonderful, but there's a certain entitlement or something. I mean, to be a true artist is, is a big deal. It's an ongoing, never-ending search for putting something truthful you know, in front of people. And also, I think, also putting before people the era that we're living in through what you do. And she did that. So that's another reason. That's a very long answer to your question. Hey, that, look, as an interviewer, I live for a long answer. Yeah, I do long answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, how about this one? How does, ta you, you brought up Judy Garland. Mm -hmm. How does taking on Edith Piaf differ from playing Judy Garland? Good question! Because I did a show on Garland. I did a very interesting show on Garland. I know. Yeah, well, I was actually, before I did, no, I guess I did that show for, it's called Heartbreaker, mm -hmm. written by John Meyer. John had had a relationship with her, an affair with her for three months. She left him when he could no longer supply her with pills. And then five months later, she was dead. So it was the very end of her life. When he met her, she had $5 in her pocket. She hadn't bathed in a week, and she had lost caps. I mean, she was a wreck, a real wreck. They met in another friend's apartment. He was bringing over one of his songs for her to look at, and she left with him when that friend went to have a bath, I think. And she left with John. So she was desperately clutching at ways to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Right there is a big difference. I mean, desperately clutching with a desperation alone is not a word that applies to Edith Piaf. So anyway, I did this show. It was a very interesting show. He ended up taking his book he'd written, Heartbreaker, and making it a play with music. There was just, you know, it, it, it just ripped me up. I, en I enjoyed the experience. It was a very provocative show because this man had lived her, lived with her, loved her, touched her, kissed her, rebuilt her career to a great degree. He knew, he knew her. It, it was nothing sensational about it, which all the other things had been quite sensational that I'd read or seen about her. This was the real deal. Mm. But it was not, there was no epiphany. There was no benediction. This was just a very sad tale. Of, and even though she had great moments of gaiety, Garland, she did, or you wouldn't care to watch her. Mm -hmm. I mean, she did, she was extraordinary. But the bottom line was, it ripped you up. It ripped me up. I had no energy at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So... I wanted to find a project that I could have, that I could be engaged with for a very long time. I mean, at this stage of my life, I want to do something that 
energizes me, excites me, thrills me, challenges me. Um, with this project, I'm never even sure. I don't even know what it's going to be in a couple of years. That's I have great. A, no, I have it's a, like a living, breathing. She, well, I'm, I've taken on a life. I've never done that before. I've never done uh, my own show that's based on a real person. It's a huge responsibility. Do you, you feel like you're embodying her as opposed to like covering her songs when you're performing Something them? in the middle of the, I don't try to. I mean, I can't be Edith Piaf for so many reasons, you know. I mean... You know, being born on the ghetto and and raised with addicts and thugs and abandoned by my mother and you're talking you know, about her now. I'm talking about her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I couldn't know what any of that is like. I I don't want to know what that's like. Sure. But I like it all. I like all the facts of her funneling through me, with what I do know of tragedy or what I do know of being abandoned or what I do know of this kind of sadness, as well as the incredible construction of her life. Not just the destruction, but the construction of her life is something I can't know either. You know, in the wings of Carnegie Hall, she's got a needle. She is plunging it into her thigh through her stockings in the wings before her entrance so she can get through 27 songs. Talk about contrast. For a 10-minute ovation. The, the classiest so place that, in the world. and ugh. I know. So I can't know what that is and ever. And I wouldn't you know, have the hubris to say, oh, yeah, I know it. Uh, but I love letting it run through me. And I know that it will deepen and be more colored through the years as I do this piece. Has anyone from her life uh, or her, I guess, estate is the right word, been uh, become aware of this project? Not Anyone yet. reached out to you? I have spoken to people who've heard her sing, mm -hmm. and which, you know, I, I would love to know what it was like to be in a room with that sound because there's something about her sound that only a few artists have, which is that we call it the overtones. Mm -hmm. But her sound was so much bigger. She was four foot eight. I mean, she was teeny. I didn't know she was that small. She was that tiny. I thought she was about five feet tall. No, four foot four eight. Four eight. Yeah, four eight. Wow. And yet she was like a, a big open vessel. Mm -hmm. And her sound came out of her and went right through you and went through the room. And she was just empty with her feeling. And her feeling, what she filled herself up with, was not, the songs were her life. She said... My life is my song. I like that you said it in a French accent. A little bit. But, <laughs> a little bit. But she said that. And so her songs were. So she put her life force in her songs. And when she sang, it, it just rang. And people said that they, they would burst into tears. They wouldn't even know why. Because it wasn't even so much what she was singing. It was how it was coming through her. I found myself in tears listening to your versions of her songs, yeah. even when they were in French and I didn't know the French. And I know that was one of her goals, was to convey the meaning of the song, even if you didn't know what the yes. words were. Yeah. I read that because you wrote these beautiful little vignettes um, mm -hmm. explaining Edith's uh, experience with each of these numbers. Yes. And I read them after I listened to the album, just without looking at anything one time through, and then I went through a second time and read along. And when I got to the part where it said she wanted people to cry because they understood the song, even if they didn't know the language, yes. I was like, well, mission accomplished. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, when you think of performances that do that for you, and even, like, I remember as a little kid just listening to records, you know, of all the Broadway shows, which we had that with yep. Broadway shows. And you would put on Mary Martin or you'd put on Ethel or Streisand or Julie and you would listen to these vocals and even if being that little I didn't know exactly what they were singing about the energy in their voice of what they were putting over whatever that song was conveying for that point in that show you just would you totally. know you know you're just in it and and it and you you disappear and there's only that expression, that phrase, that voice, that moment. And your heart is just wide open. You have no defense. And that is what the true artist aims for, mm -hmm. to be empty and make the connection of what they're singing, share it, you know. And when that happens, I mean, ha, that's why we do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We should mention that you're going to be in San Francisco yeah. in a few weeks, beginning of, oh, next week. Yeah, like yeah. Sunday. Yeah, it's like, like really soon. I just, yes. I can't. It's always hard for me to think of the next month as being just a few days away. It's hard for me to think of the next day yeah. being a day away. I know. Yeah. Mm. Um, so uh, you're going to be in San Francisco mm -hmm. uh, at the Fairmont, which is just Haunted. like the most beautiful. The, San Francisco is my hometown, so I know the, oh. I know the venue well. Yeah, play that. And, room, by the oh, way. Well, her ghost will be 
ever like even more present. I know. You I better know. be ready. I, I'm ready. I listen. It's just be another level of being haunted. I'll be happy. I just want to say that the uh, the uh, album was put out there by Tommy Krasker of PS Classics, mm -hmm. and he also allowed me to get a vinyl. So I will have a <gasps> vinyl of this. Cool. A limited edition of 300. Is that cool or what? Yeah, very cool. And, and how big was the orchestra? It was massive. 36 pieces. Ooh, I, feel I like... worked with bigger, but they were really big. <laughs> <laughs> I was... feel, well, for, for an album especially, because I feel uh, like, I feel like, and to, and to listen to it on vinyl with that little crackle. Um, I don't think it's going to be a little crackle. That's with the old vinyl. Well, I thought it, it was like if you had a little dust on the needle. I thought oh, that's yeah, what made it probably. crackle, not the, not, I was not questioning the quality of the vinyl. <laughs> okay, probably you're right, yeah. But I feel like that adds ambiance. It makes you feel like you're back in, like, you know, the middle of yeah. the 20th century with, with Piaf herself. I just wanted her to be preserved for anybody who wanted, was a collector, because mm -hmm. people collect vinyl, and it is a pure sound, actually, yeah. than uh, a download or a, a, or a CD. So if you want that experience, I have to say, the, the, the experience of recording it Yes, there were 36 musicians. At the time, it dwindles down to fewer. But I recorded in a church in London, which is, of course, a studio. But I've been there four or five times called Angel Recording Studios. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, again, haunted, beautiful space. And it's the nave of the church you record in. And my tradition when I record is to, I like to go into the room with all the musicians. Because, you know, everybody's isolated, so you can retake if you need to. But I like to go into the actual big space and lay it down once. And the very first cut is Him à l'amour, uh, Him to Love, which is a beautiful piece. And I remember walking in there and meeting, you know, you sort of meet everybody. And my conductor, arranger, um, orchestrator, excuse me, Larry Blank, is brilliant. And he knew all the musicians. So there was this camaraderie, because if, if an orchestra doesn't like you, they won't play well. But they love him. So there was this bond already established. And, when we, and then suddenly, suddenly somebody put a microphone in front of me. And we started the first track. And most of that is what's on that first recording. It just, there was this chemistry, this alchemy, this energy in the room, which is when it's at its best, when every mind is focused on one thing, and it's the music mm -hmm. coming through the conductor and the voice. And when you hear it, it's just, it's another level of uh, music making. It was thrilling. It's clear you're doing what you love. Yeah. And <laughs> you, have, you have earned it. You know, you have been at it for just such like you've you've such legs to to what right you from do. high school into New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you look back at at Oklahoma and on your toes and think about uh, you know how that how the lessons you learned as a straight out of school, you know, like kiddo taking on <laughs> Broadway and how that s set you up for what you're doing well, now? Is so there a through line? Just loving the music, I suppose, is the through line, and having it, loving something that deeply, and loving the expression, loving words, loving text, trying to be true to, you know, the piece you're in. It, it keeps a certain level of humility, I think, with what you do. I'm not saying I'm the most humble person in the world, but I, I try to bow to the original, you know, writers when I do something because it always will be different coming through you. And, you know, I was pitted against the memory of Julie Andrews. You know, my very first big show was My Fair Lady. And, you know, the Times had Julie on one side as a flower girl, me on the other side as a flower girl. And, you know, like, take that. And I, it was so weird because I, I never felt that way. I love Julie Andrews. I couldn't wait to sing the score and honor her. It was not, there was no resistance in me. So uh, through the years, I've kept the good parts of feeling like that, which is a certain kind of innocence. Um, and, you know, I see where I deviated, and I understand why now. So I, uh, I accept the detours along with the straight aheads because that's being human. Yes, yeah, Piaf said maybe eventually I'll be able to sing Je ne regrette rien and sing it, you know, with no regrets for anything I've ever done with absolute conviction. I'm not quite there, but maybe someday. Yeah. I can Have you that. gone to see the new uh, the newest revival of My Fair Lady no, or no, the no. the production of Oklahoma? No, no, I want to see both of them very much. Uh, I've been traveling too much. Well, they're both fantastic. Ah, uh, yeah. Get I, those have, I have to look at your blog or something about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a few questions from the audience in a few minutes. Um, 
And if anybody watching live wants to submit a question via Twitter, mm -hmm. it's at Build Series NYC. Before we do that, I want to make sure we give everyone an, uh, the information on where they can follow you on social media and your website so they can get all the tour dates and, of course, order the album. Yes. Well, ChristineAndreas.com. Uh, I try to have everything posted there. I do have a Twitter account. I can't remember what it is, but I put it's tweets It's at Christine Andreas. That, yeah, without the E, though. Christine without an E. Oh, so it's Kristen Andreas? I, I didn't even know. notice that. Yeah, I'm so maybe, glad you I caught know, me and corrected I, me. Somebody took the other one. What? I know. What's with that? We'll make some calls. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great. So we'll go to your website as the main source I for so. all of our yeah. information. And I put on it on Facebook here and there, you know. Cool. Oh, you're going to have the best time in San Francisco. I know, yeah. I'm tempted to fly out there, but the scheduling won't work. You'll have to do the show in New York again. All right. I'll be there, front row. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to read that Edith Piaf book, too. It's a too. wonderful book. In the meantime, you've gotten me really fascinated. I'm so glad. Uh, what I, did you love about her? I mean, what did you like about the music? What did it do to you? Well, I expected it to be kind of sad and to feel very old fashioned. And mm. I was kind of like dancing around my apartment listening to it. It was, it was more joyful, I think, than I expected. She was more and joyful. I'll be the first person to say that I didn't have much knowledge of her. I knew mm. Lovie and Rose, but not much more than that. Yeah. Um, so in a way, this was like listening to a new artist for me. Mm. And then I went back and listened to some of her original recordings kind of to compare them. Mm. But it was the way that I thought of Piaf as someone you would listen to when you were sad. And instead, I found it giving me energy, and I could feel your joy in the work yeah. as I listened to it. I'm so glad. What a lovely thing to say. Yeah, because yeah, people do think she was tragic, and that was one of the things I wanted to dispel. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. well, mission accomplished. Thank you. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, what was your biggest challenge while recording an album in a language that you don't speak? Um, as a native speaker, and how did you overcome that challenge? Hmm. Well, I said it, I hear the music in French, but there's these little, del this, this, okay, you make your mouth doing ooh, and then you say e, and you get e, e. And I didn't do that enough, so that really, and I thought I was doing it, and then you hear the playback, and it wasn't there. Um, I guess not being frustrated was important, um, because basically it was really joyful to do. But I am a perfectionist, so when I would hear myself miss something, but it sounded so beautiful, the phrase, and, go, and you still have, you have to, I just didn't want it to go out there. Not quite right. I mean, people are forgiving. Like, if you hear a French artist singing, you know, in English, and you know they're singing, the falling leaves drift by the window. We all think that's so beautiful. You know, we don't care that they sound French. So my Parisian friends assured me that my little American accent was charming, charmant. So I'm just gonna have to go with that. But that was a little bit frustrating because in English you don't have to correct your English. <laughs> did you have? Did you work with a dialect coach at all? I did a bit. I was on a cruise. My dialect coach was Hubert de Souderay, and he was a shipmate, and he was Parisian. And we would sit in the cove or one of these little bars, having you know, fake absinthe or something like that, and he would coach me. And, and also Pascal, if Pascal uh, Rio dance, he would help me. So I had friends who were Parisian and artistic. And my cousin Nancy also was a oh. French teacher. Oh, nice. Nancy Brocker, so she helped me too. Oh, wonderful. And gave me confidence. Because a lot of it is, you know, feeling the courage to do it, yeah. you know. Um, we have another question. Hi, Christine. Hi. Um, my name is Lori. I'm from... Quebec. Uh -oh. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and I came to New York City actually to graduate from the Martha Graham School. And oh, really? Yeah. So How bizarre. I yeah, I would take um, everything you were saying. I was like, oh, I want to know more about working with Pascal Rieu. I oh, mean, yeah. I would take his wife's class every day, and um, that was great. But just working with different artists, if you have any, like. Well, working with dancers. Yeah, dancers. Was extraordinary to be singing. Songs with such emotional depth as Piaf's, because they all are pieces of her life, like she said. And, you know, the things in a life that matter, time doesn't know that. We all want the same things, no matter what age we're born into. So it, her music is really timely. So to do these songs, you know, with a guy, a Parisian choreographing in this incredibly emotional style. I mean, La Vie en Rose, the La Vie en Rose we did, which is this, most people know this, God. You know, it's a really happy song. What well, was written during World War II. So he had a beautiful 
these two beautiful dancers coming together down a runway. He's stripped to the waist, just coming out of World War II. And she looks like the traditional 1940s girlfriend in a house dress. And they, you know, the crescendo of this song, they meet in the center, and he hugs her and holds her, and then he drops her to the floor because he's in post-traumatic stress. And the whole pas de deux is him spinning in and out of post-traumatic stress, but loving her, wanting to love again, but having to get over what he'd been through. And so the ability to love takes on a whole other dimension when the song to this beautiful romantic song, which is associated with the war, all of it just worked. It was such an alchemy. And to sing to that, these beautiful, you know, he's like this ready to strike her and she takes his hand and she softens it and rubs it on her face. And you're singing to that. So you're phrasing completely different. It, it, it worked me in a really good way. Wow. Yeah. It's like several languages. It is. On top of each other. It is. We have yeah. time for one more audience question, and then I've got one last one. Okay. Hi. Um, so my question is, what one piece of advice would you say would you want to give to your younger self before, like when you just came to New York? I suppose patience and listening to that voice, which I always had. I had this little voice. It's not real big. It's not real demanding. But it's basically saying, you can go here and you can go there. This is really the right way, you know? But it's real quiet. And a lot of times, um, see this chin? It's a very willful chin. <laughs> I would go that way. And I wouldn't say it was wrong, but it would be this giant detour to get. And it deepened me, the detour. But, you know, if I'd gone that way, I always wonder. You know, so I, I would say, listen, there's something really guiding us all, for sure. Do you think it's been Edith Piaf this whole Hold time? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's been with you since oh the beginning. God. Okay, what a so nag. <laughs> this is, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, and oh. I'm going to take a little leap, but Piaf was not Edith's given name at birth. Piaf is a nickname in it. I right. think it loosely translates to Sparrow, yeah. which is a the little like, sparrow. songbird. Mm -hmm. Um I, songbirds don't need any accompaniment. <laughs> and so I'm going to take that and say, would you be willing to sing a cappella a little bit of your favorite piece from the album? Sure. Oh, it doesn't take much to get me to sing, honey. All right, so this is un Under Paris Skies. Do you want the whole song or just a little piece? Just a little bit, li okay. maybe like. This just sort of gets you going with the muscle of what. We want people to, to, to give people just enough so that they can't mm -hmm. resist buying the okay, album fine. immediately. So this is Sous le Ciel. Take it away. <sighs> Sous le ciel de Paris saint val une chanson. Mmh. Elle est née d'aujourd'hui dans le cœur d'un garçon. Sous le ciel de Paris marchent des amoureux. Le bonheur se construit sur un air fait pour eux. Sous le pont de Bercy, un philosophe assis de musiciens, quelques badauds, puis les gens par milliers. Then we go into English. Well, that was amazing. <laughs> this is the album. Christine Andreas, Pee Off, No Regrets. Go and purchase it on CD. It's available for download and soon to be available on vinyl as well. Christine Andreas, thank you so much for being what here with pleasure. us. a pleasure. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you.